Guys, on this episode of the Born to Made podcast, I sit down with my childhood friend, John Seymour, founder of the incredible restaurant group Sweet Chick and also Little Sweet Chick. John's an amazing guy. We dive into old school stories of New York City, growing up here, and uh, it's going to be a good one. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to the Born or Made podcast. Uh, Born or Made podcast is a podcast where I meet with uh, entrepreneurs, high performers, people that influence the world and me, people I, uh, I'm inspired by. And today, I want to introduce a very old friend, good buddy, and uh, awesome entrepreneur, my boy, John Seymour. What up, John? What up, Mike? Welcome to the show. <laughs> uh, so the Born to Me podcast is, uh, is a podcast where I meet guys like you, gals, guys, um, and we talk, about, um, we talk about what's going on in the world today, but specifically, I like to pose the question, um, do you believe that high performers, influential people, uh, people that have gotten to a certain level of success... Uh, that has inspired a large group of people or influenced a large group of people. Do you think that they were born with the ability to get there? Or do you think that the, it was made over time? I don't want you to answer that question now. Yeah. Uh, but the goal here is to really just hang out, um, ask you a couple of questions, and really get your story. Yeah. Because I think um, at the end of the day, human beings in general love to listen to stories. Yeah and identify with people, it's very easy. It's part of like even the marketing and branding and stuff that you've done, that I've done. It's like we're very authentic to who it is we are, and that translates often to our customer base and you know, or client list or whatnot. It's like people can kind of see themselves in you, and uh, I think that's what attracts people to my business as well. Um, I think I've seen it work for you as well, so. Yeah, man. So John, you... Um you launched and founded a brand called Sweet Chick. Sweet Chick is how many locations now? Uh, we have five locations, plus we have a quick service version of it um, at City Field with the Mets as well. So six, six locations currently. And tell us what Sweet Chick is. So Sweet Chick is, um, you know, it's, it's a restaurant, full service restaurant. Um, you know, we serve what we like to call new American comfort food. Um, I heard the story of how chicken and waffles was invented in Harlem in the jazz clubs, um, you know, in the 1920s. And I had always thought it was a West Coast thing or a Southern thing. And, and being the native New Yorker that I am or that we are, I was kind of like, wow, that's, it was interesting to me. And I thought that no one was really kind of taking that and using that um, as a vehicle to deliver different types of flavor profiles, create an environmental restaurant, I mean, a, like a experiential restaurant, a space, um, you know, or a brand around it. And I was like, nobody's really doing that in New York. So I thought there was a kind of a hole in the market for that. Um, initially, you know, Sweet Chick started out, you know, chicken and waffles was at the core of our menu, but I really wanted it to still become a neighborhood restaurant, somewhere where you could come, uh, you know, five nights a week if you wanted. You might come in the first night and you said, oh, I heard they have the bomb chicken and waffles or whatever version. We do a bunch of different flavor profiles. And you come there for that, but you look over at the other table and you go, oh, shit, what are they eating? Um, that looks good. I want something like that. You know, then you'll come back the next night. You might have you know, braised octopus and gnocchi on the menu as a special or something like that, which is right now what it is. Yeah, I remember the last time I ate at uh, Sweet Chick. Um, the menu is awesome. It's yeah. not just chicken and waffles. It's not just chicken and waffles. I mean, we've definitely kind of like, you know, planted our flag and said like we're a chicken and waffle restaurant, but it's, you know, you can still come in and have like, essentially, that's what we call it. It's like new American comfort food, right? So there's the whole new American restaurant theme and obviously we're serving some When you want, like, so new American, I mean, I what mean, I know it? it's a term, right? It's a term. It's a term, but, but let's just dive into that for a second yeah. and then I want to, and then I want to talk about your, your story. What, what is New America, man? I mean, what is America? America is a blend, and my parents are immigrants from Ireland. Uh, am I American or am I Irish? I grew up in New York. It's a melting pot. Um, I think when you that term New American is really you know inspired by the world, you know, um, or inspired at least by some of the regions in America where like people were influenced, you know, or culinary destinations in the country. You know, I wouldn't say. Um, you know, Wisconsin is like 
a new American haven mm -hmm. or something like that. But I'd say that we've taken dishes from across America as well and kind of modernized them and used maybe French techniques to, to, to bring them up, you know. To elevate them. To elevate them. Yeah. So. Yeah, you know, because I, I mean, I, I, when, I, when I think of New American, and that's definitely a term that's been, been used a lot, yeah. and, and by the way, like, I think it, it, it is it's a class of its own yeah. at this point. You yeah. know, I feel like um, really what, what I think of when I think of New American is using sort of the bounty of what we produce here, like the local produce. Yeah. Um, and using some classic American dishes. Like when I think of a class of American dish, I think of like a hamburger. A hamburger. Like most new American spots yeah. have a dope hamburger, hamburger on the menu, right? And so Elevated hamburger. Elevated hamburger. Hamburger that you're gonna spend seventeen to twenty five dollars. And a on. steak. And a steak. You know, a steak and you're gonna you know, but and uh, a great piece of fish with yeah, some yeah. local produce. Yeah. Just simple stuff that you can wrap your head around that there's sort of something for everyone, but we're using great ingredients and uh, and, 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 and offering sort of like a wide range of, of food. Yeah. Um, I gotta say, man, you and I have <laughs> probably just about the most similar story <laughs> out of anybody I know. Yeah, and it's funny because I was like, oh, I'm going up to meet Mike, I'm gonna do this podcast, and I was like, it's gonna be kind of weird because I'm like, if Mike's asking me questions, I was like, so many times, and we've known each other for a very long time, um, Since I'm in first grade, kindergarten, yeah, and I think. I think have taken different paths but similar stories to get to where we are, and we've bounced a lot of stuff off of each other. Um, I remember I was telling a story today because I was knew I was coming up here. I was like, I had opened up uh, my first restaurant was Pops, a little burger shop in Williamsburg, and I remember you being like, "Yo, should uh, what do you think of Williamsburg for the meatball shop for the second location of the meatball shop?" And I was like. It's, fucking, it's dope, it's popping over here. And so it's like, you know, we even in, during our like entrepreneurial timeline, it's like we bounce things off where like, I was doing a raise for Sweet Chick and I, hit it. I know you guys I went through it at Meatball Shop, so I was like, let me see what mistakes Mike made so that I can try to avoid some of those maybe. Mm -hmm. That's what it all is, we're all gonna make mistakes, right? Yeah, it's dude. like, so if you have people to kind of bounce that off, um, it's pretty wild. But yes, the stories are aligned. Like when I just say, you know, it's just, it's interesting. We grew up like nine blocks away from each other. Yeah. We went to the same public elementary school. Yeah. We sort of hung I out. I think your sister was in my class, right? I forget. I kind of, or no, maybe she was a year younger you're, than me. You're, 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 what are you, three, four years older than me? Yeah, but I was, um, yeah, I think I'm three years older than you're you. Like, but then I'm I was three, also four years old, but I left, I got left back four times. Yeah. <laughs> No, but I was the youngest in my class because I'm a December birthday. So oh, I was right. always like almost a year younger than everybody in my class. And then I graduated so maybe high school in 96. I, I, okay, so you're two years older than me. Nicole yeah. was one year old. Yeah, okay, so she was like a great artist. Yeah, that's what it was. But, yeah. you know, we were in the same sports program. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, Cougars. there was Cougars, <laughs> Cougars playing, yeah. playing street hockey in Randall's Island. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we, we grew up so close to each other. Uh, we definitely were hustling and on the entrepreneurial sort of path from a very young age. Just, just always... being a New Yorker, I mean, it's kind of a, a, a rite of passage to a certain extent. So tell me about, well, let's go back. Let's go way back. Because the idea here is to really sort of hear your story. And as you tell your story, I, just, I, I probably will interrupt you and just yeah, yeah. sort of pull out some, some extrapolate some things that you said yeah. that I think could potentially lead us to uh, a potential answer for this question yeah. I have. Um, so I've been doing a lot of thinking about kind of what the whole topic of this uh, podcast is. And um, just to start way, way back, um, you know, parents, immigrants uh, from Ireland, so they had that kind of typical work ethic. So I think I grew up around that, you know, like, but it was more of a, just kind of work hard to get a paycheck type of thing, uh, very blue collar um, kind of lifestyle. Um, my father was a bartender, my mother was a nurse. Um, I was telling you earlier about how, and, and in my, as far as like, as far back as I can remember, I didn't, wasn't thinking of it at the time, but I, uh, I remember my brother telling kids at school that you know, my father owned the bar. And I just kind of ran with that because, and I, and I think at the time I realized, I said, 
I think it's because maybe my brother is embarrassed that my father's just the bartender, so he wanted to make himself feel a little bit better, but I, and, and probably myself as well, that's why I ran with it. That's not why, I, I didn't just call him on the spot because I would have been, you know, like, so I kind of just kind of went with that. And even today, when you came in, you were like, yo, your father owned that bar. <laughs> and that's the thing is, right, it's like that perception probably, you know, continued around our group of friends or people we knew or whatever it was because, you know, we, we allowed that to happen, right? So um, I think my father always wanted to own a bar. And we used to go to Ireland as kids for the summer. Um, all my extended families there, like, it was such a weird dynamic because, you know, and now I'm thinking about it now, it's like all my uncles were kind of ran their own businesses as they ran the farm, dairy farms and stuff like that. So I did see that. But, um, you know, we used to drive by this bar from the airport, Shannon Airport, to like one of my uncle's farms. Um, I think it was called the Six Alley, when I, if I can remember. My father, every time he used to drive by, he used to say, I was going to buy that place. I was going to buy that place. And we would have moved to Ireland and grew up in Ireland. You know, that was kind of the, the plan. But it never happened. Um, so I think there was always this kind of like feeling that my father always wanted to. I think there was a lot of regret. Um, you know, he was a huge Red Sox fan. Um, he has a similar story to me as well. He used to say, if, uh, if God never invented whiskey, he would have been the coach of the Red Sox, you know, because my father also was an alcoholic and, uh, you know, got sober before we were born and was a bartender, um, like myself eventually. But, um... I think there was definitely like some kind of like the entrepreneurial want was there somehow, or at least my father wanted it, and I don't think he ever achieved it. So I think there was kind of like a, there was some kind of sense of something. I don't think I was aware of it at the time at all. Um, but that's, uh, it's just interesting to me when I think back on it. And it, it's one of those things now today that as I own places, um, I've actually had one of my father's old bar guys, the guys who used to drink at the bar every day, there was always a cast of characters like Cheers, you know? Um, one of them came down to one of my restaurants recently and was just kind of like blown away. And it was almost you know, like I just want to, you it. know, th there's a word that you said that actually, yeah. it's so interesting. I, I, I haven't actually spent a lot of time thinking about the word, but the word own. Yeah. Like, you know, my father was also sort of a, um, he, was, uh, he was an entrepreneur. He was an entrepreneur that never unfortunately really made it yeah uh he was an electrician you know oh. and so he started i was also an electrician by the way we'll get into that later <laughs> but but he start he started his own little electrician business yeah and he 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 was really good with lighting so he would do like lighting design and, and he was a master electrician and so you know but he never really he never was able to get anything off the ground but i always remember him saying i own my own business yeah and i feel like as a kid, like when you hear that that word "own," um, it it's 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 impactful. Well, it's impactful. There's a certain status level that comes with that, and that's again like why why did my brother like I remember that moment. It's like why did my brother choose to lie about that in that setting, right? It's not like we were around a bunch of rich kids. I mean, we were in a public school. It wasn't like you know, but although it still was you know, Manhattan is still filled with all types of people, but like. Why did he feel like he needed to say that as opposed to say, oh, my father works at the bar over there? There's like a certain status to it. There's a power to it. There's also something about like our neighborhood that we grew up in. And, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, uh, I mean, we call it Yorkville, but yeah, it's yeah. really the Upper East yeah, Side. Yeah, yeah. There, there was such like a, like when you say. The dynamic is crazy. Crazy. Because when people you say that you're, it. you're like from the Upper East Side, people just think yeah, yeah. that you're rich. Yeah, yeah. You know? It's, it's. You know, it's because we're here and we both understand what we're talking about. It's very hard to communicate that to someone who doesn't. Um, it was a very unique time, especially even in the time period um, where rent control was still a, a, a really active factor, um, where people could grow up in an, an apartment in Manhattan um, for, you know, 100 bucks, you know, because your grandmother lived there or something. You know, it's like there's, you know, a lot of those people are gone now or whatever it is, but... It, it really is a, a super unique dichotomy of just like wealth and you know being sandwiched between projects in Spanish Harlem and here, and then you got downtown creative, and then you have this like working class mixed with you know the wealthiest zip code in the world at the time, probably right? Yeah, like from from like 
Lexington Avenue to yeah. Fifth Ave. And then from like York to East End, there was a lot of wealth. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's so, it's so funny to think because I just, I, I remember, you know, growing up up there, like it was, um, you know, like on a Friday night, you go to some house party yeah. on like Park Avenue and you're like, holy shit, yeah. this is the craziest thing I've ever seen. And also like their parents aren't there because their parents are in the Hamptons or something, you know? Right. Meanwhile, like my parents weren't home because my father worked at night and my mother took care of old people and worked two jobs. So like we didn't have parents watching us because they were like literally like trying to pay the rent. And it was really bad for those kids when kids like for those kids that threw those house parties <laughs> when kids like us walked in the room. It was yeah. not yeah. it was not a, it There's was not good. <laughs> There's a lot of stories. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so so keep going. Um all right, so I think uh just you know the whole thing uh, with my father being a bartender and you know Back to like, you know, being born or, or, or bred, it's like, you know, I saw the guys who owned, the, the, my father worked at a couple of different spots in the neighborhood, and he was kind of a, he was a, you know, kind of like the people's champ. He knew everybody, you know, so like, there was a lot of community building and stuff like that, and that's kind of where I, I got a lot of that from that, and I use today, but, you know, seeing the guys who actually owned the bar, you know, and wondering why to myself, like, why do they own the bar? And my father has to go work for them. You know what I'm saying? There, there was definitely those questions probably, you know, came in and out at times or, or just seeing, you know, seeing the, just the differences of it or being aware of it. Now, I don't know if I was born to be aware of that or did I just, like, notice it? You do you know? think that motivated you? Um, at the time, no. But I think, you know, over time, I think there's, like, a lot of repetitive things that can happen and then you can maybe learn from that. So, you know... Job-wise, uh, at 15 years old, we talk about like you know wealth in that neighborhood. I was a doorman, right? So like if you're Irish American, you become a doorman in these apartment buildings. It's <laughs> or just Albanian. Like, or Albanian, right? It's just like it's just the nature of the of the neighborhood. Uh, my father's, my brother's still a doorman, but um, I was a doorman, you know, working at a you know a building with some wealthy people in it. When I was like 15 years old, I had a lie, but I'd say I was 18. But I knew the my father knew the super, so I got the job. And then seeing that super kind of running his own business and seeing that he had a house. I remember this one super I worked for, he had a house in Shelter Island. And he would leave on Thursdays, every, every Thursday of the summer. He'd be gone Thursday morning or Wednesday night. And then he might come back on Tuesday and being kind of like, seeing the flexibility of like the, the seeing how he run, ran the show and knowing other guys, because I had a lot of friends whose fathers were supers. It was like kind of almost like how you run your organization. And I remember noticing that like this one guy, Brian Corbett was his name. He, uh, the way he ran his organization was really tight, and he was able to go away for four days a week every, every weekend. Um, you know, he had a handyman on staff that was, like, taking control of the building and making sure there was no fucking problems. And the way he, he ran the operation was tight versus another guy who, you know, was at the bar all, every day and wasn't really paying attention, was kind of doing all, you know, things himself, never really took a vacation. You know, it was like, I think there's... And I look back on that now, and I notice it now. I don't know if I noticed it at the time, but it's that I, that I can notice it now, it must have impacted me in some way to see how this guy was able to kind of run his ship versus somebody else could, to run their ship. You know, like, and the interesting thing that I would say that also is similar between you and I, and just I think, like, you know, real entrepreneurs in general, yeah. is at 15, when... All of our friends oh, yeah. were not thinking about having a legitimate job. Yeah. You had a, you like there was something inside of you that said, "I'm gonna go to, I'm gonna go get a legit job." Yeah, and I think that really comes from, for me, it comes from like you know that Irish immigrant work ethic, right? And also because my father was like, "You're gonna have to get a job." You know, I mean, it was just that simple. Like um, you want money, you gotta get a job. Yeah, you want money, and and I remember like those checks because I had like lied and I was only 15. Uh, I think I was making like $500 a week. And at 15 years old, for me, that was a shitload of money. I was like the most paid one of my friends because of that. I used to cash my check at a bar. This is how like you used to get paid back in the day. Like I knew the bartender up at, uh, up, up on, uh, what is it, 85th in New York? Uh, Finn, old Irish guy, this, this guy, Irish guy Finn. I used to go in there with my check. My father knew the guy too. I'd get a beer too at 15 years old. <laughs> <laughs> and cash my check at different bars in the neighborhood. Um, but uh, yeah, definitely. There was a lot, you know, there's, 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 there's one person who is saying, even, if, even, if they, even though they need the money, they're, they're not going to go work for it, right? 
and then there's one that is, you know? Um, oftentimes, I remember I used to think about it, being a doorman, and I know you, you know, worked in restaurants when you were young. I remember thinking back and being like, I wish my father had put me into a different job where I could have actually learned something. I think, although being a doorman, you do learn a lot about people, and you watch their habits, and you see a lot of shit, and you see, you know, who's cheating on who, and who's doing this, and who's that, who's the alcoholic in the building, and who's this one. So you do see a lot of life, um, but it wasn't something like where you learned to trade or something like that, or you learned. Yeah, a, but a skill. you know, the, 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 it's, I feel like being a doorman is very similar to being a bartender. It is very similar to being a bartender because you are kind of, you know. You um, have to be in a good mood all the time. You have to be in a good mood, and you have to be on all the time, and it, it is, it is and very similar to being a bartender. You have to take care of people. They have to. Take to care they, of people. they like actually, you know. Hospi it is hospitality. Full fledged. It's hospitality, um, which I never really thought about that actually, but yeah, definitely. Um, so, you know, I've done a lot of different jobs. I ended up becoming an electrician. Um, I also, you know, was wild and crazy and, you know, sobriety is a part of my story. Um, and after kind of like my, that whole part of my life, I kind of came out the other side of that and got put on to this electrician in Howard Beach, Queens. And I went to work for him for like four years and became an electrician. But from the entrepreneurial side, this is definitely one, the one, like one of the times where I remember and, and I can, to this day, it sticks out to me where this guy, Paul, was the, you know, he had a non-union shop in Queens, <clears throat> um, you know, from Howard Beach, all these Italian guys I worked with. Um, my, I used to come home and my mother would be like, what, what, what happened to you? Because now I'm ta I talk like this, you know? <laughs> I'm hanging out with all the Italians, mom. And uh, I remember this guy, Paul, always had clean Timberlands, right? Timberland boots. And he had a, he had a, at the time was like a new Jeep Wrangler, you know what I'm saying? He had like the, the clean Carhartt hoodies, you know what I'm saying? Everything, he was always like put together. Crisp. He was crispy. Um, he had the brand new Nextel phone, like the, the new version always, like we had the shitty ones, you know? And I remember Paul would come to the job, check in on us, you know, what's going on? We'd be rewiring a house, you know? Um, and I remember being like, I want that. That was like the first time where I was, I think I really recall like being in a work environment and being like, I want that. So. He was the boss? He was the boss. He did, he the ever, did he ever say anything to you that you can recall being like, oh, I wanted to kill him many times when I was learning. Because I remember like when I was learning how to become an electrician, uh, he would be like, get me, you know, uh, two, three BX from the truck or whatever. And at the time, you're like, I had to learn on the job, you know, so I would go and would like get like a, a coupling or something, a three quarter inch coupling. And I would go and I used to have cargo pants, so I would just like get four of these, 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 and then I'd be like, here, is this it? And he'd be like, if it was the wrong thing, because I learned very fast, like, if it was the wrong thing, forget it, it was a problem. Um, so I would then I'd be like, oh no, is it this? Is it this? I learned how to like, you know, get around that. And then I obviously learned how to do it and I got my own van and, you know, I kind of worked my way up there. but. Did he do anything to like inspire me? Are you saying? Was there anything? Was there any piece of advice that he gave you that actually stuck with you? Not really, not really. It was more so like just the the idea of like, you know, we're over here, you know, breaking our ass, and he's able to kind of like he was dealing with the customer, and he would be kind of showing up to the sites, and just knowing that like just seeing what that the ownership was, or like the you know like just that level of it, you know? Um, that kind of lit a fire under me, and it was the first time I ever <clears throat> actually took a step to, to say, like, I want to own my own thing. So I didn't, never, I didn't go to college after high school, <clears throat> and I was around, like, 20, no, I was, I was, I was like, 20-something years old, yeah, 22 or something at this time, or 23, and um, I was like, you know what? I, looked, I just looked into what it would take to become a master electrician. Um, and once you're a master electrician, you can actually get a license to open up your own shop, unless you work under somebody else's license. Um, and the way to do that is get on the job union experience for like seven years. I think you can play around, but you have to have like seven years experience, or you can get an electrical engineering degree um, in four years and go to college. So I was like, shit, All right, I looked it up. I went to John Jay College. That lasted a semester. And I was like, I, don't know. I was going to night school, you know, at weekend school. And so I was like hustling. I was mm -hmm. like, you know, I'm gonna, I want this. I'm gonna go try to get it. Um, that didn't work out. I started 
drinking again as well. That was like part of my whole thing after the electrical stuff. Um, got so when I finally got sober, I was already still drinking that whole period, but um, I just kind of put that behind me. You know, I kind of was just like I almost like gave up on it a little bit. I was just like, yeah, whatever. And then I was just like, what can I do to make money? You know. And I kind of felt ashamed a little bit at the time because like, I had gotten in some legal trouble and I was still working for the company. And, I, and my boss was like, he's like, yo, I can help you out. And I was just like, you know what? Let me just forget about it. Yeah, I just like, closed the door on it and just kept, kept it moving. And then followed in my father's footsteps and became a bartender. Um, I had worked in restaurants at, you know, as a kid as well during breaks and this, that, and the other. So I was familiar with it. And I obviously worked at my father's bar. Um, but I was like, let me... Uh, let me get a job bartending. So did that, realized money was better. Um, started working in the clubs. Money was even better. Um, I remember, I was thinking, because now I'm coming up to talk to you today, I was like thinking of just times when uh, I was working at some club and I went by Frank where I used to work. And I remember being like, like yeah, I made like $800 last night at this club, you know, because <laughs> it's a club. Mm. And I remember you being like, like, you had a great thing at Frank's, but you were kind of like, shit, man. I remember that too. <laughs> I think you were like, shit, man, maybe I should fucking I should get a job at one of these clubs. Um, and that's really what, you know, working in the nightlife didn't necessarily, I don't think, contribute to the entrepreneurial side of things, but I think I always had that hunger. And, you know, as I started to save money, I was like, what do I do? You know, am I going to bartend like my father for the rest of my life, or am I going to try to figure something else out? Are you going to try to pick up where he left off and, and, and... Yeah, go build something on my own. Um, and, and I wasn't really sure, to be honest with you. Um, and until I met my wife, really, I think was another thing that kind of put a battery in my back was the thought of having a family. Um, you know, I'm married 13 years now, so that was when the idea for my first restaurant came about and I was like, I got to do something different. I'm not going to be one of these career bartenders, especially not in nightlife, because there's, there's only a certain, there's a window for that. You know, you can't really do that shit forever. So um, I just started, I got on the computer and I started looking literally like my first, <clears throat> my first thing was what can I do? So I started to ask people, people that I thought were successful. Right, that I thought were successful, because not everybody is even mm -hmm. as successful as you think, as you think they so are. So when you say I, I thought, like people that I thought were su successful, like who was the first person that popped into your mind? Um, it was a friend of mine that like, you know, he had some money and apparently he had some like real estate investing stuff. But he had, right, what I found out was he was just trying to figure it out himself, you know? Um, I did, I, I, don't, I don't remember who I talked to about the restaurant industry, but this stuck out to me for sure. And I had asked somebody about restaurants, and I was like, and they were just like, don't do it. And I remember being like, fuck you. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's how I felt, um, like, almost like disrespected. I understand what they meant, and I've been asked about opening restaurants now that I've been, you know, successful at doing it. And I, my, my answer is very different, you know? Um, it's, not, it's not don't do it. It's, you know, I, I'm, I get real with them. Like, it is a very, very, very challenging business to get into. Um, and a lot of them fail, right? We, I don't know the percentages, but they're up there. Um, so I kind of took that as a little bit of a, of a diss, you know? And that's when I started kind of even looking a little more into it. I think that kind of forced me. But another plan of mine, and I'm, thank God I didn't do it, was taxicab medallions. Like, I just started to figure out. I was just that's looking. such a classic New York City kid to think yeah, about. Yeah, I, was, I just started thinking, like, yo, what is this, that, that, that? I'm like, I was just trying to put it all together, and I, and I started researching the taxicab medallions. And I, at the time, I think they were worth, like, half a million dollars for a medallion. They're worth, like, nothing for now. Medallion. Exactly. That's why Uber, Uber crushed it, right? It would have been like me trying to open a Blockbuster, you know, or Champagne Video. Champagne Video. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah, if you if you got video, if you got Blockbuster stock. Oh, uh, man. Sorry. Rough. But, um, Netflix turned it around, though. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Those guys. You know? um, so, you know, it's, uh, 
I think the taxi cab thing was just kind of like, yo, what can I do? Like, I was just like, really, what can I do? And the thing that I realized is that no one can tell you what to do. Because people come to me now and they ask me what to do. And I go, you kind of just got to do. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, you can, you can take bits and pieces of advice, but you also just have to, like, step up to the plate and take a risk. Lift up point. rocks. Yeah, exactly. And lift up rocks and find some things. So the taxi, I mean, I, I literally for, like, a couple of weeks was calling myself the taxi cab king of New York. <laughs> Like I was like, yo, I'm gonna be the I'm gonna be the taxi cab king of New York because I was like, I had to, I was like, okay, okay, I get one taxi cab, then I can get a driver to drive. You know, I'll drive in the beginning, I'll, I'll split it with somebody, I'll get two drivers, I'll get three, whatever it is, and then I'll put down, I'll get the next medallion. And I'm, in my head, I'm like, I'm gonna have ten medallions, they're gonna be worth half a million dollars each. Ba -ba 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 -ba. I started doing the math, and I'm like, okay, cool. And then uh, something God something drove me that. away from that. Something kind of drove me away from that, and I found. Um, I mean, literally, how I found Pops was my first restaurant. Um, it was my first time investing into a restaurant, at a, a, you know, in any shape or form. And how I long ago was that? That was like, ah, man, man, that was like 15 years ago now, probably. It's got to be 15 years ago. And it was, uh, I literally found it on Craigslist. So it's so funny because I actually met Craig from Craigslist recently. <laughs> he came to my coffee shop. And somebody was like, yo, that's Craig. And I Googled him. I said, that's fucking Craig. That's and hilarious. Out, and I started talking to him. I was like, yo, man, you got me my first restaurant. Oh, my God. <laughs> Craig from Craigslist. So, um, so Craigslist. Is he a cool dude? Super cool guy. Super normal, normal bugged out dude. Really? Um, yeah. So That's so funny. Um, I, uh, I was researching just like different businesses for sale, to be honest with you. I wasn't even specifically going to open a restaurant. And... Um, and I was just looking, and I was just like, what can I do, what can I do, what can I do? So I found this place. I lived in Williamsburg, um, or Bushwick at the time. And I found this place that was for sale in Havermeyer. It was a little burger shop. I forget the name of it, but uh, I went there, and I didn't really love the location. I was just kind of like, uh, but the guy op owned this place called Kitchen Delight that was on North 8th off Bedford, which I eventually took and turned into Pops. Um, and he didn't really want to sell that one, but I talked him into selling me that one instead of the other one. And, you know, the, my, the idea was, you know, my father used to make burgers for guys in the neighborhood. I was going to kind of name it after my father. Um, my father had passed away when I was 19. So it was like, you know, kind of like an homage to him. And like, I just thought like, this would be dope. We would hand make burgers and kind of just have a better experience than what, the place was a, like a little shitty shithole burger spot, you know, like infested with rats and frozen burgers. That's what they were selling, you know? I was like, if we get fresh meat and we do this, you know, and this is before Shake Shack and all that, you know, like, but that was my idea. It was like, we do fresh meat and, you know. Open up a dope burger spot. Open up a dope burger spot, neighborhood spot. Um, and, but, but still, with the vision of saying, if this burger spot can make me five grand a month, then I can open another one, and that'll make me five grand a month, and then I can open another one, and that'll make me five, you know, like, it's just like, I wasn't what made, So ever, what made you think, like, were you, was there, was there like a book you read, was there any reason why you thought to think of, of, of an opportunity to create something that you can multiply and open up a number of units in? Um, as far as books, I, I read more books today than I, I used to, but I'm trying to think, man. I mean, that Rich Dad, Poor Dad book, I remember I read, was one of those books I read very early, and I think it, you know, I don't know, know remember what I took from it, but I, I remember taking something from it and being like, you know, just kind of the perception of what money is, and like, you know, there was a lot of, uh, just the way you think about it, you know? I think you can open your mind um, and unlock things in your brain that kind of can let, help you to evolve and, and kind of grow beyond where you were previously, um, which is why maybe being born that, or you can learn that, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I think things do affect you, so. Um, it just sounds to me like listening to your story and knowing that, like, we skipped over a bunch of yeah. the, the, I mean, adversity plays a big role in your story yes. and my story. Yes, and, and so to, to, to go back, and, you know, I definitely touched on it, and, you know, drugs and alcohol are a big part of my story. Uh, arrests are a big part of my story. Um, you know, I, uh, there, was, uh, there was a time in my life where I was on trial looking to go away for three to seven years in prison. And I got arrested while I was on trial for something else. So, like, I was definitely faced with adversity and, and you know, real shit was going to happen in my life, could have happened in my life, and I'm very blessed um, in a lot of ways, but definitely getting through things and getting sober, like realizing and, and, 
and like, you know, taking that on it even as a challenge. Like, was there, I mean, because I, I, you know, when I think back too, I, I'm sober as well. And um, I mean, when I hear your story, I'm, I truly do. I feel like it's so wild yeah. how, you know, we have such yeah. a similar story. It's, yeah. crazy. it's crazy. It's crazy. People like, tell me that too. They're like, yeah, you know, you know, do you know Mikey uh, Seymour's? And I'm like, yeah. yeah. I mean, your father passed when you were 19. My father passed when I was 20. How old were you when you got sober? 24? I was 24. I was 23. It's just yeah. weird. It is very weird. And we're both in the restaurant business. Both, you know, restaurants blocks away from each other. Uh, multiple units. Do you it think, is kind of crazy. Was there, crazy. Was, there a mo was there like a moment? Because, you know, I feel like turning points in life are where you learn the most or just crash and burn, Yes, right? It's like, and, and I feel like there are certain people that can just power through and learn. Yeah. And then there are other people that just unfortunately don't fold. fold. So it's interesting that you say that because there's been, you know, we were just talking in my office about Instagram and stuff like that, where like you know everybody's putting out their best, their best in their life, best self. Right? I don't put down, I don't put up the story where like the adversity that I faced growing a business. I know you've had tons of adversity. I've had tons of adversity. Shit happens. Everything is not always sweet. Um, and because of some of the adversity that we've faced, and I've been told this, like you know, um, I'm not a typical business guy, businessman. You know, it's like I've been told this by people that even work in my office that like. It, they're, they're kind of amazed at the way I've, I handle situations because I like if there's a problem facing me, I'm gonna try to see can we go over it, right? Then can can we go under it? Can we go around it? Can we pay the problem to go away? What can we do to get this problem to go away? And ultimately, if we can't do any of those things, I'm going to kill the problem in front of me. Like if it's a brick wall, I'm gonna smash through the brick wall, and I'm just gonna get to the other side. Like it's not. It's no question. Not, no question. Like, it, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, of course, we're going to do what everybody does. We're going to try to go over it. We're going to go to try to go around it. We're going to do this. Um, ultimately, if the problem's still there, I'm going to fuck the problem up. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, we're just going to crash right through it. And that's like the analogy that I've been told in my office isn't, I'm going to fuck the problem up. It's like, sometimes it'll be like, John will just punch down and break down the wall. Like, if, if the wall's not going to come down any other way, we're just going to take it out. Um, and that is probably from adversity that we've faced over time. And why is it that, that we have enfolded? I don't know. Why is it that successful people, I mean, you read all the time. It's like successful people are persistent and just, you know, they don't give up. It's like not giving up, not giving up. And it's weird when you hear those type of stories because sometimes you should give up, right? Like sometimes, like, your idea isn't good. You know, or, or like, like. Well, you. I mean, you closed the business, right? Like, you oh, closed. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Pops, I closed. You closed. Um, well, Pops. Pops. So we had a second location of Pops. Um, I got a deal in the city. Um, and it was a kind of a sweet deal, and I had a partner with it. And we changed the model of the restaurant, and it became. It was a sit-down restaurant. So like, we were so we were. You know, Pops in, in Williamsburg was successful. You know, till till the day we closed it because we had no lease. That's a whole other situation, but. Um, the one in the city didn't work. And the reason why it didn't work is because the model wasn't right. We were like, you know, and that was a lesson to be learned for the next, for the next project. Um, How did you deal with that? So what, what, what did it feel like when you were going into that? Like, there was, when you knew? Like, when did so, you know? So with Pops in the city, right, we, we set it up as a sit-down restaurant selling $5 burgers. It didn't make sense. And, and it wasn't high volume, really. And, you know, it was very reliant on NYU college. So there, there's a lot of reasons why it didn't work. But within a year, I knew that it wasn't going to work. We were breaking even. You know what I'm saying? And like, you know how restaurant business is. Tons of times, it's like, oh, you break even first year. Congratulations. You're doing well. I was just like, it's not worth the time. It's not worth the effort. And I was like, if I can find a buyer for this place and I can get out of here without losing any money, I'm going to do it. So I pulled awesome. the trigger and did it. I also saw that the model that we did for this didn't make sense. You know, it's like, sometimes you'll do things and you're gonna make a mistake. And then it's like, are you gonna live and die with that mistake? Or are you gonna, are you gonna switch it up? So either I couldn't get a small, I couldn't turn the space into a smaller space, 
right? Space is gonna be what it is, the rent's gonna be what it is. Um, and I was like, even the way the layout was, I was like, we're not gonna change it into a quick service model now um, and be paying that rent. So it's like, we would have rather got a space half the size to do that. Um, so I said, let's see if we can, you know, put it on a fish hook and see if we can sell it within a year. So basically almost like a year to the day, I was like, cool, I'm out, boom, got my money back, opened up Sweet Check. Learned a lot. Learned a ton, learned a ton, learned a ton. Did it, did it, did it fuck ego. you up? So, so the only thing is ego, right? So like, I'll tell you, this is a, an actual personal thing. I don't think I've even ever told anybody. But that restaurant, I had a, uh, I had a coin that my father had. Um, not a coin, it was like a keychain, this keychain thing, it had like an Irish flag and an American flag on it. And I have a lot of like things, but I had put it in the cement of the bar, and of the bar at the, at the one that we closed down. And I remember like, just the ego side of it is like, you open something up, you're like, oh, I don't wanna have to like close it. But at the end of the day, I have to look at myself in the mirror and say like, I have to do what's right and what's smart. You know what I'm saying? Mm. And if somebody's gonna like, I, I ran into a friend recently who has a business, and they were talking about a location that they have in LA, and they were like, they were like, oh, I can't close it, because like, it, and I, in my head, I walked away thinking, nobody's gonna care, man, only you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, like, really? So true. And if somebody does care, they have bigger problems. You know what I'm saying? Like, they got bigger problems of their own self-esteem if they really care, you know what I'm saying? So like. So what is that, so like that, that, that piece, because you know, it's, it's interesting, there's like closing a business, right? Um, taking an action that doesn't actually work out and like being cool would just like move on, right? Well, yeah. I, I, you know, people ask me shit, uh, people ask me if I, when I'm getting ready to open up a business or open up a new restaurant part of the group or, or like just start something from scratch, people are like, are you scared? And the honest truth is, no. Yeah. I'm like not, I am not scared. And I don't know what that means. I haven't really dissected yeah. that. Like I haven't really like gotten into why is it that raising money, putting something out there that if all goes well, thousands slash millions of people, millions of people have eaten at Sweet Chick. Yeah over the years. Millions of people are eating meat, meatball shop and Seymour's. Creating something that millions of people are gonna touch and feel and experience is a real fucking thing. It's yeah. real impact and that, if you make no money, yeah. is success. Yeah, it's still amazing in itself. You've made sure. an impact and you've changed, yeah. you've, you've probably changed people's lives yeah. with, with experiences that they've had in your spot. Yeah. So like, the fact that you saw that with that, with Pops on A Street, yeah. and you were like, you know what? This isn't gonna work, I'm gonna close it. Yeah. Like that to me says, there was a fearless, there's a fearless gene in your DNA makeup yeah. that does not, because I think most people would be crushed and oh, would yeah, hold yeah, on yeah, as yeah. tight as they could. Well, they would, they would hold and bleed, and bleed out, you know? And, and listen, I'm not saying that you shouldn't, uh, you know, weather the storm at times. There are times where you need to weather the storm and make sure like you're, you're consistent to your brand and sometimes that happens. But there's also times where it does, it's not gonna make sense and you can see, you can foresee the future. And for me it was, in that instance I said, what's gonna happen here? I'm gonna keep this restaurant, it's gonna take my time. Um, and it's gonna break even. And maybe it'll be profitable, even because like, that was the thing, it's like it wasn't, it wasn't failing per se. It just it was it was like breaking even first year, and I said, okay, cool. Second year, you know, you build a business. I just didn't see enough of the return. You know what I'm saying? I was like, what's the what's the what's the best case scenario that's going to happen? The amount of energy, time, the and amount of energy. I said it's not worth it. So I was like, if I can get rid of it, I'm going to get rid of it. And if I can get rid of it and even make a profit, that's even better because um, we had like an amazing lease deal, right? So we had some kind of inside deal, and it was like. You know, that's how I ended up taking the partner on there because they got some kind of deal for the space. So I knew I had some value there as well. Um, so interesting too about that space, right? Like that block, since we were kids, has always been like a hot block. Yeah. There's always, it's when always, we were kids, it was hot, for sure. There's like nonstop people yeah. walking over that block. But 
it, it, has been a, it has been a wasteland for yeah. restaurants. Yes. It is a tough, and you wouldn't necessarily think so. Like if you no, stood, you wouldn't because you're still downtown, and you're it, like, oh, you're still in Manhattan, and you're downtown. And you're and, also like dead center NYU, yeah. Yeah. Selling, selling $5 hamburgers yeah. in the center of the NYU campus where there's yeah. 50,000 kids. Like you're like, oh my God, this is a gold mine. Yeah. And it's just so interesting that restaurants have not been successful on that street, and yeah. that is the fucked up part of our Even business. Even quick service restaurants. Yeah. In and out. Yeah. Um, was that experience like humiliating or humbling? Um, I don't know, man. Honestly, I wouldn't say either. Like, I, I, it's hard for me to put myself back in that place. I definitely had to deal with, um, you know, the emotional connection that you have to a space in general where you're kind of like, damn, I don't want to fucking fail. You know what I'm saying? But I'd say, like, when I think of it now, to me, it's like it was an invaluable experience. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think um, identifying the problem there, I mean, Sweet Chick wouldn't have opened if it wasn't for that as well. So, you know, it, it's, it's just part of, the, part, of the, it was part of the plan. Part of your journey. You know what I'm saying? Part of the journey. It was a necessary thing for a you. A necessary thing. And to, to, you know, to kind of like what we're saying, it's like I think there's a powerful aspect of being able to say, um, all right, this is not going to be a winner if I can take, take, you know, get rid of it without taking a loss even. And I probably even made a little bit of money on that deal. Um, it's a win. You know what I'm saying? It's a win. Um, experience gained, uh, lessons learned, invaluable lessons learned in my story. So it was... Uh, Do you think you learned more from closing that restaurant than you had from opening up one of your most successful? Um, yes. Yes. Maybe not like, like in the Sweet Chick brand, for example, like the first one is different, but like, let's just say the Prospect Heights one, uh, in, near the Barclay Center, uh, you know, we opened that, and it's a it's a monster, and like, it's like the lessons, yeah, from from your successes, you don't really always learn so many lessons, you know what I'm saying? Wild. Um, opening up in LA, we had more challenges with management stuff. I learned way more from that, you know. So like, am I learning more? Um, you you want to try to avoid as many mistakes as possible and try to navigate it, but yeah, a, a home run is just like you knock it out of the park and you run the bases and you're done, you know, like. It's, uh, it's, it's easy, it's easy, but that's what we're all striving for, right? Um, and you know, as you grow, it gets different and the problems get different and the challenges get different. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, there's a lot, you know, lessons to be learned are like just invaluable, I think, in any business, but specifically in this business for me. Um, I'm glad those things happened, uh, so. So you, so that so that happened, and then how 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 soon after you closed that restaurant was Sweet Chick opened? I think the opportunity came like right around the same time to take that space. Um, so that space was right up the block from from Pops, uh, right at the corner, right in, right down the block, right on the same block as the meatball shop in Williamsburg. Um, it was a great location, and I was just like. Let's do it. I think I had the location before I even had the concept, and I was just like, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do a neighborhood spot, and then you know the the concept kind of evolved and and it still evolves, you know. I think. Talk to me about the name, um, Sweet Chick. So, in coming up with the concept, it was you know I really knew that we were gonna do the chicken and waffle thing, and I, I heard that story, and I was just like, no one's doing it, but I was like, I want to have a full cocktail program. I want this to be a full service restaurant, um, not like a fried chicken joint, you know, um, and a place where I lived in, I lived around the corner from there. So I was like a place where I can come and I don't have to eat the same, same thing every single night. You know what I'm saying? And so, um, and uh, I remember when we sat there in the beginning and you were like, I don't know, maybe you should just do the chicken and waffles and uh, no appetizers. And I was like, nah, I want to course it out. I want to like have like a full, full thing, um, which is always going to be harder to do anyway. Um, and when in testing product and like literally frying, you know, I don't even know how much chicken we ate because the construction took a while. So the kitchen was already ready, but construction took a while. So we were in there and we're frying chicken and um, still thinking of the name. We didn't even have the name or the logo or anything. Like it was all like really, you know, how you do things sometimes, mm -hmm. get, just get it done. Um, so we were just thinking about uh, brines for the chicken and we put sweet tea in the brine and I was like, that's interesting, sweet tea. And then we're like, oh, maple syrup is sweet. 
check in, sweet check. And we're like, oh shit, that's a good name. Was that's it got you? Right to it. It was. It wasn't me actually. It wasn't me. It was actually one of my original partner's brothers. Actually, came up with a different name at first, almost as a joke. What was it? Sweet cock. <laughs> And good I was thing, like, good thing that one. Sweet cock. And I was like, yeah, sweet chick. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> oh boy. So, you know, because we were just throwing everything at the wall. Yeah. You know, we were yeah. throwing everything at the wall. Uh, and that stuck. Um, you know, and it, it had a ring to it. And, you know, we just took that and ran with it. I, I met up with an artist guy. We made a logo. Um, you know, very mom and pop style, really opening that first location, you know, very hands on. Um, I design. I mean, there's no design company. I designed the restaurant. I bought all the shit. I was living in there every day, look, staring at the wall and going like, "What do we put on this wall?" And let me drive around and go to a bunch of places and find something. Okay, what do we do here? What do we do there? Um, and that was it, you know. So, you know, one of the questions that I get asked often, um, and I think probably most startup entrepreneurial companies. Um, when there's a founder and yeah. not, you know, like, you didn't, you, you're, not, you're not a business school grad. You know, you didn't go to school for interior design. Nope. Uh, you know, you're not a chef. Nope. As, as a guy that, that put together a crew yeah. to do something awesome, do you believe that you have a single strength and now I'm sure you I'm sure you do. Yeah. And now you probably focus a hundred percent of your energy on that and you have people that 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 take care of a lot of the other stuff, the financials, the business, you know. Yeah, so for me, um I don't know, I'd say like my single strength is kind of knowing my customer base, I think, is one of my, you know, like, like being in tune with my customer base. How do you think you learned that? Um, or do you think you always had that? I think I might have always had that. You were born with it. I think I might have been born with that. I think I might have been born with that. I just didn't know that I had that in many different play areas of my life, but I think I might have been born with that. Um, and do you think that that is the, that's it? That's, that's what's gotten you to where you're at? No, not, not, not that alone. Because I think the dealing with adversity, tenacity, um, pride, whatever it is, you know, like a certain type of pride that you have in yourself or, or whatnot. I think uh, being a problem solver really is like also part of that. You know what I'm saying? So like always being constantly looking at things from different perspectives, you know, like trying to be um, empathetic, right? Like in every circumstance that you're in, um, being able to try to put yourself into other people's shoes. I think that somebody else has told me that in my office. They were like, they thought that, that was one of my biggest qualities, right? They, which I didn't even think of, right? They were like empathy or something like that, where it's like you can really kind of feel what other people are feeling or some shit like that. Um, and in the problem solving, but like as far as you know, my office goes. I mean, at some point you have to, you have to give people the opportunity to lead their teams, to um, to do what they're good at and what they're brought there for, right? The reasons why they're hired. So if it's somebody in the finance department or running finance department or somebody running, but you know, as a CEO, uh, I definitely I do. I have my hands in everything, and I'm kind of you know. I'm not, I'm not like micromanaging anyone. Like that's definitely, I'm like the farthest from that. I think numbers are a thing that I like too. So like I'm always gonna wanna be involved in that and really kinda like try to find ways and creative ways to like get those numbers better. Um, so I'm always, I'm always looking at a P&L and like trying to like figure out and like why are we here? Why are we spending more there? Why are we not spending, you know? Just really trying to like that's like a puzzle to me, so I, I I I kind of enjoy that. But at the end of the day, I'm not trying to be a guy paying the bills. I'm not a tech guy. You know what I'm saying? Like in the beginning, you had to be. In the beginning, well, starting Sweet Chick, I wasn't as much on the finance, right? I wasn't as much involved in it because I was more focused on building the brand. Um, so like, 
the money came secondary, you know? And, and money isn't, you know, you hear this a lot from people, it's like, it's not the driving factor, right? It's like, it's definitely a residual effect of the, the work you're putting in. If you're doing well. If you're doing well. But it's, it's not the thing that like drives me. Right? You don't wake up thinking about getting rich. No, sometimes. <laughs> you know, I mean, listen, who doesn't want to have money, right? Like, I have three kids. It's like, uh, you know, I want to provide a good lifestyle. So, of course, it's there, but it's not the driving factor. It's not the thing that gets me up. At, like, I'm not like, today I got to go make some money. That isn't anything like that. T today, it's like, you know, for me, it's like, I love building shit. You know what I'm saying? I really do love building things. Um, but at the same time, I want to see, like, the thing that I'm building now, it's like, I want to see it through, and I want to, like, get to the promised land. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm constantly in the future as well with the business. So I'm like, you know, where can we be in the next few years? Um, you know, I told my, my the GM that started with me um, at the first restaurant, and I say this to people, I've said this to people as we've grown. I'm like, I don't want to blow smoke up your ass. You know what I'm saying? I really, that's not my style, but I'm not trying to stop here, you know? So like, if you're down to like get involved and like come on this ride, let's see what happens. I can't promise anything. You still got to show up and do your job. But like, if we grow, we all grow. You know, that's how it's going to be. And and I'm not stopping. Um, at some point, yeah, of course. You know. Uh, Does your staff love you? Um, shit, I don't know, man. It's so it's like it's such that's such like a hard question to ask. You know, you'd have to literally ask them um, specifically because it's like I. I but could, it, I, it actually isn't. Yeah, I, I couldn't. I couldn't answer that myself. You know what I'm saying? Like, I couldn't answer that myself because it's not my personality. You know, like, like that would be like taking their power away from them, essentially. You know, like I, I, I believe that I have a great relationship with everybody that I work with, um, especially like now. It's like the business has changed, right? From the first restaurant where you're there all the time, I'm opening the door for the customers coming in and out. I'm talking to them. That's where you learn the magic of the brand, and you're like. Wow, people love this place. So I just want to stop you because you build I, I know people that work for you. Yeah. A lot of yeah. people that work for you. Yeah. Your staff loves you. <laughs> yeah. Well, they, they you love know, you. And, 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 and like the reason why I say that is because, like me, I am not in this shit for the money. Yeah. Money's awesome. Of course. Money is going to create comfort in my life exactly. and in your life. And your kid's life. Um, you know, but I'm not in it for the money. Yeah. And, and I know that is true, and the staff knows that is true. Yeah. I'm in it for the journey. The experience. And creating great shit. Yeah. And, like, you, you're, you're, look, you're, you're a humble dude, and, and, um, and I know that about you, and that's why I like you so much. Um, but I know that your staff loves you, and by the way, I know my staff loves me, yeah, and yeah. like that's okay, yeah, yeah. right? Like, I know, but that's always for me. Like I just, it's, I, it's always my personality, and I'm like, oh, you love me, great, cool. They right? love you, man, and and <laughs> and I believe. I like to think that they do for sure. I know they do. Yeah, and I believe that that piece, that component of your organization, is probably the most important I agree piece of the of the of the pie and also the glue that keeps it all together I don't think that your staff is like they don't walk around saying oh John is the best businessman on the planet they yeah. walk around saying John is the man and he's <laughs> giving me an opportunity to be myself yeah and do great things, yeah. and he's not up my ass, and he's a guy that I can sit down and talk to about anything. Yeah, and I believe, and 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 I, I to 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 kind of put my spin on what you're saying is like that. That's like I, I thought you were going to say that that's the most valuable asset you have, which is essentially what you're saying. To me, taking myself out of the equation, it's the most valuable asset, and I know I know that you think this way as well. Um, and the big, big, most important part of the business is that our staff is happy doing what they're doing. Um, you know, listen, you don't have to always be happy to go to work, but I want to create an environment where you love to be a part of what we're doing. Um, and I think 
whether it's me in the picture or somebody else is in the picture or whatever it is, it's like the most important part. And, and for me to be cool to, with them and, and for, that, for them to love me is part of it. But it's like for them to be excited to be a part of what it is we're doing is, yes, the most important thing, piece of the puzzle. Because if that's gone, and we, we, we know about this and we know what happens with a lot of these other businesses. Like you take that guy out or you take that energy out and things change, man. Big time. Things change. Um, 100%. You know, uh, a VC company comes in and says, hey, I'm bringing this guy in. He, he used to do this and that and the other. And sure, it can work for a time. Um, but that energy or that, that intangible quality is gone. Um, and usually, typically, a founder is the one that really instills that to begin with. Um, unless you can find a great person to succeed them that understands the culture. Very rare. Very rare. Very rare. Um, or somebody is brought up within that to take over. Um, but yeah, I mean, of course, you, you know, I mean, I think par probably also like there's a, a, a part of my personality or any entrepreneur's personality who's in hospitality is that you want to be a people pleaser and you want people to be feel good and you want people to, to be happy about their day, their life, whatever it is they're going through. Like we support people. Like I'm never mad when somebody says, Hey man, it's been fun working with you guys, but I'm going to, you know, go pursue my passion, you know, whatever that is, whether they're an artist and typically, you know, servers and stuff like that and restaurants are passionate about that. Dope. Let me know when your first art exhibit is. Can you teach what you do, you think? Like, do you think it's I think a teachable it's teachable. Skill? I think it's teachable. I don't know if I could teach it um, because I don't know, you know, I think I think a course could be derived from like somebody sitting down with me, you, a couple other people and pulling those things together and seeing how do you actually like quantify these things and like implement them. Um, I think it could be taught because I think there is like a lot of, um, it could be taught but could, it's like. You think you can teach, because I think you hit the hard. nail on the head yeah. when you said empathy because I agree and it's probably because A, our upbringing, B, our, the adversary we went through see the um, innate sort of ability to uh, not judge somebody from this hierarchy level. Yeah. Um, really sort of look at your peer eye to eye and be like, yo, you don't work for me, we work together, together. style. Yeah. I'm a regular guy. Like, dude, I don't think I'm, that's I'm still, a, I'm still an electrician in Howard Beach. Right, and you, you know probably walk into your restaurant and if you see some shit that needs to get picked up, you pick it up. It gets picked up. It gets picked up if, I mean, whatever. Whatever needs to get done can get done. You know what I'm saying? Granted, you know, I do work in an office during the day. Like, my, my, my daily routine has changed over time for the restaurant and for that business, and it will probably continue to need to change if we're going to keep growing. Um, and you do lose touch, and it's hard, and you got to, you know, find ways to kind of still interact with some of the, the people on your staff, or you need to at least be bringing in people um, you know, at management level that really understand what the whole thing is, you know, and it's like, uh, and you need to be able to at least like, you know, instill those things in them so that they can lead their own teams. I mean, ideally, personally, it would be great. You get a manager that's like, damn, you don't need me at all, man. You got one. I love Kyle. That yeah, dude yeah. is the man. Yeah, yeah. We got a few in the other restaurants too. It's like, you know. Wilmer, so, Kyle. Yeah, Chip in LA. I mean, Andrew down the Lower East Side. I mean, it's like, you know, we got, yeah, it's the key is to bring good people in, right? Um, and you know, as in, in, in any business, it's you know your business is really as good as the people you hire. You know what I'm saying? It's like your business is good as the people you hire. Yeah. So so you've got you got five sweet chicks. You've got little little chick, which is in uh, in City Field. My wife has a restaurant. Your wife has a restaurant. Pearls. Pearls. Um, Coming from where you came and to where you are now, dude, it's like, it's inspiring, man. Yeah, and, yeah. I, and, you know, and, and you've also partnered with, like, one of the most iconic uh, hip-hop stars of our generation, yeah. Nas. Um, and awesome. for a guy like that to, like, be inspired by your brand, um, yeah. made it just an impact. Um, you know, if there's, a, if there's from, from all you've done and all you've learned, yeah. if there's a... If there's something that you would share with, with the people listening, because I, 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 I don't believe what you have 
can be taught. It's teachable, man. I yeah. think it's it's something that you have, and, yeah. and and it's not something that you got. I think it's something that you have. Yeah. I mean, it, I mean, to really put it simply, like like what you're saying there is that there's times where like I will hit a flow of like speech, right? Where I'll be like, you know, around the team or whatever it is, and I don't even know what the fuck I'm saying, but it's coming out, and they're hearing it. And it wasn't taught to me, and it wasn't, you know what I'm saying? It's just like, it's coming from the soul, so you're just like, this is what it is, and people believe it. And if it's real, they really believe it, you know? If you're faking it, so that's the thing, it's like, can you teach that to somebody and they can actually do that in their own authentic way? I don't know. You know, it's interesting, like, I know other people um, in our industry that, like, they just don't appreciate, you know, I know... And probably because I was a technician, like you were a technician for so yeah. long in restaurants, like I know that, and this applies to I think any business, it's not just restaurants, but if I'm walking through the restaurant and I walk past the dish pit and I remind myself almost every time I walk past the dish pit to stop, turn around, walk over to dishwasher, put my hand on his or her shoulder, look them in the eye, and say, I just want to take a second to thank you from the bottom of my heart for fucking keeping this place going. Yeah. Like, that one minute or less fucking piece of my day not only sends chills down my spine when I think about saying it, and it's not something that I was taught to do, yeah. but the value that that adds for that person's day, life, week, month, year, whatever. Yeah. The, the, just doing those things um, make me who I am, and I know you who you are. Yeah. And I believe that there are people that just are not thinking about that. And they're just, and I think that that is where that EQ, like, that is where the emotional intelligence comes in and just destroys IQ. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, there's, there's just human traits that some people have and some people don't. I mean, you could say people's social skills are varied across the board. So, you know, it doesn't make you a bad person, right? It doesn't make you a bad person that you're not the guy that can talk to the the, the dishwasher or you're at a club and talk to the guy who's, you know, handing out the, the napkins in a club, you know, a bathroom. You know what I'm saying? Like, those guys are my best friends, always. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I'm, on, I'm on that level. You know what I'm saying? I'm no better than them. Um, you know, I could have easily been a dishwasher myself, you know? Uh, so I know that genuinely, and I kind of like those people. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm still, I'm still, that's why I'm like, I'm still an electrician, man. You know, I'm still a, a regular guy. I'm still a bartender. Um, I'm still, the first job I ever had was a guy who packed uh, 10 nuts, three screws, four things into a package and closed it and put it into a box this big and did that all day long. You know, like, that was when I was like 13. But it's, uh, you know, some people don't have the social skills or were never brought up in, in, in certain environments that don't allow them to be the type of people we're talking about. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with them. It just means that, you know, they're not going to be able to benefit from that skill. You know, like I don't even consider it a skill in a sense. You know, it's like it's because it's easy. just, it's it's just, just comes easy. It's just you. It's natural. So back to that question, if there's anything that you can share that you believe um, will get people from a slump to making shit happen that you do in your life that um, a piece of advice, just a piece of advice that... I mean, from a slump? Um, or just in general, just a piece yeah, of advice for yeah. someone that's just like trying to get their shit done and, and you know, and just looking for some answers, some clues. Yeah, I mean, the thing of it is, is like you never know what's going to happen tomorrow. You can't, you can't, there's no way, you can't tell, there's no algorithm, there's no technology. You're never gonna know what's gonna happen tomorrow. So if things aren't necessarily like looking the right way, um, you know, you don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow or a year from now or five years from now, you know? And as long as you're consistently and you're just trying to plug away at it and do it, you're gonna have failures. Things are gonna happen. Things aren't always gonna go your way. I don't care who you are. They're not always gonna go your way. Um, you know, was the thing they say, Michael Jordan missed how many shots before, you know, and, and only made about this many of them. It's like, come on, man. He's the greatest in the world. He didn't hit every shot. It's like, it's not possible. 
Um, so I think it just from the slump perspective, it's like, just keep going, man. You know, like keep going. What you're doing now, what you're working on now, it might not be the thing that makes you the money or whatever the accolade you want. And it might be something that you find walking down the street, um, totally not even expecting it, and it might happen. So we all have bad days, and we all, you know, go through stuff. It's like, it's whether or not you're going to keep plugging away. I mean, it's like an amazing things can happen. You know what I'm saying? Amazing things can happen in a short amount of time. You know, it's crazy. It's like people, I think this day and age is especially, we're so fixated on just getting the thing now. And it's like, real world doesn't work like that. You know, I know it looks like that on Instagram, but like, it's just not, you know? And also, gratitude. Be grateful for what you do have. I was literally talking about it today. You know, there was a time in my life where being free and having a, a job to go to, whether that was a construction site as a laborer or, and being able to eat a, a slice of pizza on the street, I still, to this day, I'll walk down the street on a nice day, the weather's perfect, and I'm having, I, just, I grab a slice and I go, wow, this is amazing. You know, like, I don't need, I don't need to be eating caviar in the French Riviera. I can have a slice of pizza on a New York City street and still be just as happy. You know, it's like, it, that, that, it's all relative, you know, I think. Gratitude. Always. Gratitude. Yeah. I love that. Um, all right, dude. So. The was question. Born, was I born, or what is it? Do you think that uh, you were born with this, uh, with, with the, the ability to get to where you're at, or do you think it was made over time? Um, I think it's both. I really, I, I don't know. Do I have to answer one or the other? No. I think it's both, because I think I, think I could have been born this way, and I could have been influenced in, in other ways to have a totally different outcome. And unless is, there is a design plan, then I was 100% born this way, born like that. But things have definitely influenced me over the time. Had I never got that job as an electrician and saw the guy with the clean Timberlands and said, I want to be the boss one day, um, you know, had my brother never, never lied about my father, like, I don't know. You know? And then there's a million other things that could have happened that did happen along the way that, to steer me in a direction. Had pops in the city never failed, would I have been here, you know? And would I have been forced with the challenges that I've gone through and the adversity that I've been through in work through this company to get to where I'm at? So I think it's definitely a blend. I think it's a blend. But, you, you know, personality is something that is unique to everyone. Um, and you're born with a personality. I believe that. I have three daughters, very close in age. They're all extremely different. They've been raised the exact same way so far. Who's so. going to be the entrepreneur? Um, Barry. Barry. <laughs> Barry's the Barry's entrepreneur. Barry's taking over the business. Barry's the entrepreneur. So I have three, three daughters. Barry's the entrepreneur. Milan, who's one of my twins, is going to be like my assistant. You know what I'm saying? She's just going to rock with me. Um, Jed is going to be the artist. So based on that, I think you're saying born, dude. I think I'm saying born. I think I'm saying born. And I think you're, you're right. Now, the more I think about it, I'm born. Whatever my influences would have been, I probably would have still come out on this side somehow in a different shape or form. You know, maybe I'd own, own an electrical company or maybe I'd, you know, own a friggin' ice cream store. <laughs> John, thank you so much for uh, hopping in. Yes, that was a great me. combo. Thanks for having me. There's a lot of valuable info in there, man. And um, your story is inspiring, dude. I'm sure your story is going to inspire a lot. Um, I love being your friend. I love calling you up and chopping it up with you and, you know, running into you. And, you it's know. like, it's, it's weird for us to chop it up because we do have such a similar thing. It's like... Both married 13 years. Yeah. Two, I got two kids. You got three. It's wild, man. Yeah. But um, life is good. Cool. Thank you, my man. Yes.